But of course, that uh, also gives you an idea of maybe an opportunity. And I think in South Africa, we are going to continue seeing the capacity of the state receding and it will leave many, many gaps to be filled. Hello, David Ansari here of the Center for Risk Analysis. Last year on the channel, we had a video which did surprisingly well, 77,000 views, which outlined some of the key risks facing South Africa in the year ahead. We'll link to that in the description below. But we also had a comment from one of our clients to suggest that maybe we do a follow-up which looks at the opportunities in South Africa in the year ahead. We thought this was an excellent idea and we featured some of these opportunities in our weekly risk alert which goes out to clients every Monday morning at 7 a.m. The principal author of the risk alert is John Endres. He is the director of the CRA. He joins me now. So John, some of the risks are well known to our clients, but what are some of the opportunities that may emerge in the wake of the failing state in South Africa? Um, I think that we find ourselves still in a very low growth environment, um, beset by many, many uh, economic risks which makes it quite tricky, I think, for investors to find opportunities to invest in. And so we decided to give a bit of thought to where those opportunities might lie in this challenging environment. And um, we listed those in, in our latest risk alert, as you mentioned. And uh, for South Africa, we think that the state continues to recede. Um, that was a, a, an important topic of our discussions last year. Uh, it started sort of in a really spectacular fashion with the July unrest where we saw that the state was quite incapable of maintaining law and order um, or preventing widespread looting and arson. And that, I think, was a wake-up call to many people um, who probably in many cases were already aware of what was going on in the sense of the uh, receding capacity of the state. But it was very much a flaming reminder of what uh, the situation is like. And I think that was reinforced, of course, at the beginning of this year, when uh, Parliament burned down, the National Assembly building was severely damaged by a deliberately set fire. And as it has emerged, uh, a great deal of blame can be apportioned to the authorities for not maintaining the sprinkler systems and the fire protection systems in place in the building. Uh, and once again, this is another illustration of the receding state. Uh, it's also quite notable, I think, that the uh, problems that the state has in enforcing its authority and supplying its services used to be mainly uh, in the periphery of the state, in rural areas and smaller towns, but it is moving more and more to the center. And of course, the seat of parliament really is you know, at the very heart of government. Um, and that is uh, quite concerning that such a fire could take place in such an important place. But of course, that uh, also gives you an idea of maybe an opportunity. And I think in South Africa, we are going to continue seeing the capacity of the state receding and it will leave many, many gaps to be filled. And that ranges across the whole spectrum of services that the state is meant to provide and is less and less able to provide, ranging all the way from education. Uh, we know the schooling system isn't great and that low fee private schools, for example, are very popular and gaining traction to healthcare where we see that private facilities um, are used by those who can afford to use them. And I'm sure uh, many more people would use them if they had higher incomes in a growing economy. Ranging also to security, uh, private security companies, as we know, are a feature of many South African towns uh, where people rely more and more on such services rather than the police services. And of course, also electricity and water, the really fundamental building blocks of functioning communities and also businesses. Increasingly, people are relying on their own sources of electricity, solar electricity, generators, et cetera, and in water um, boreholes. And in some cases, also, you do see communities getting involved in trying to fix the broken municipal water supplies and trying to get things to work again. Enjoying this analysis? Click here to sign up for our 30-day free trial for more content from the CIA. Okay, so there are going to be also some regulatory obstacles. Uh, we saw uh, many of these community groups are also facing uh, legal hurdles that they need to overcome in order to replace some of these services. So they're going to have to gear up in terms of their ability to advocate more forcefully for uh, authority to be ceded to them. But uh, let's maybe focus, John, on uh, the more micro level as an individual operating in this environment, looking to make investments. We at the CRA are strategic advisors. We're not investment advisors. Or financial analysts. 
Uh, but we do have a, a few thoughts uh, that we shared in the risk alert. What do you think are some of the financial opportunities that exist in this very volatile environment? Well, I think, um, firstly, to come back to what you were saying earlier, there's a town called Koying Nas in the, the Northern Cape. And there was a story about it in the Sunday Times, which I found quite unbelievable, which is where residents uh, took it upon themselves to fix potholes, get the water system working, and you know generally do the things that the municipality was failing to do, and uh, had a court interdict preventing them from doing so. So uh, you often, I think, see that where the private sector or individuals and citizens try to get things working, they're not always allowed to do so uh, because the state does try to hold on to its powers and privileges. But um, as its capacity recedes across all areas, it probably will be increasingly less able to assert its authority in more and more areas. And I think it really is going to be a trend of this year and the coming years that we will see residents and communities doing things for themselves. When it comes to um, global opportunities, I think we're still in the bull run uh, on global equity markets, for example. And uh, for those uh, uh, seeking investment opportunities, that is a sort of an easy option to take. But we are increasingly worried and nervous about the very high levels of asset pricing, uh, asset prices, and expect that there is going to be a very sharp pullback at some point. And that, of course, offers an opportunity as well. If you manage to time it right uh, and you have some liquid reserves that you can deploy, you might have a, a great opportunity to buy the dip, which could potentially be very, very lucrative. But in that, of course, timing is key and getting that timing right is very, very difficult, but potentially also very, very lucrative. Then, of course, um, we saw that across much of the developed world, inflation is picking up to uh, levels not seen in many, many decades. So inflation hedges are something that is uh, worth looking into. Uh, what that is uh, might be a little bit unclear. Um, traditionally, it has been something like gold. I guess cryptocurrencies could be added to the list. And maybe some currencies that are maintaining their stability might be added to that list as well. All right, John. And one of the last points that you made was around the move towards uh, green energy renewables, uh, which has been very aggressively pushed in developed markets, uh, but seems to be having an adverse impact on energy prices, which is adding to this inflation problem in the first world. Uh, what opportunities do you think are there? Do you think there might be a pushback against some of these ESG requirements? Yes. So that's, uh, I think, a slightly counterintuitive way to look at things um, because, you know, the, the, the dominant view is that there is a pullback from fossil fuels because they're seen as less acceptable and damage, more damaging to the environment and that therefore any investments in fossil fuels um, are probably not going to be good investments. The counter view to that is that we might see uh, a mismatch between supply and demand, where supply gets curtailed as ESG activists manage to persuade fossil fuel companies to divest and reduce their output, at the same time as demand does not decline, because re renewables are not able to fill the gap that is needed to, to provide enough energy to de the developing world and its economies. And if that happens, you might see um, supply being artificially constrained at the same time as demand stays the same or even increases. And if that is true, then we should expect energy prices to increase further and also, of course, the stocks of energy companies to rise. All right, John. Well, this analysis was featured in our Monday morning risk alert, which is every Monday morning at 7 a.m., uh, we'll also be incorporating some of these insights into our strategic intelligence briefing, which we're updating at the moment. Well, I think we'll, we'll have a very uh, interesting and informative strategic intelligence briefing, which traditionally we update once or twice a year. And we are in the process at the moment of uh, updating the information and updating our uh, expectations for the year and years ahead as well. And uh, for CRA clients, I very much encourage you to book us to come in and take you through the latest briefing. Um, it will be very much worth your while. John Andrews, thank you very much for joining us on the CRA channel. Let's hand over to you, our viewers. What do you think are some of the key opportunities that might exist in South Africa in 2022? Leave your thoughts in the comments section below. And if you would like to become a client of the CRA, you can do so by clicking on the link in the pinned comment. That'll entitle you to access all of our content for free for 30 days, so you can try out our content before making a commitment. 
our weekly risk alert is included in that offer. My name is David Ansara. This is the CRA. Until next time, take care.